Are we ready for our next speaker? So, we've heard about solicitors about how to get the deal secured correctly. And then raise your hand if you'd agree, a lot of these people that have got awards just now have, got, have created themselves a first world problem. Yeah. Raise your hand if you'd agree. What's the first world problem they've just created themselves? A tax bill. Yeah. Unless they sort that shit out and learn how to keep the money. See, you got to create a problem and then solve the problem. So what I thought we would do next is bring on the person who can help solve that problem. Would that be helpful? Yeah. And over the last... 10 plus years, I have kissed a lot of frogs with accountants. I've never kissed this guy, just to point out, but there's, there's a lot of accountants out there and he will be very upset if you call him an accountant. Here's why. An accountant is a bean counter. A tax advisor, right, what they do is give you advice to save you money. You see, an accountant will take your information and submit it to HMRC and say, they're a, they're a tax collector for HMRC. And they will say to you, here's, give me your books, thank you, here's your bill, thank you. But the person I'm about to introduce to you is not an accountant, no. He is somebody who will help you keep what you make. Who likes the idea of keeping what you make? Yeah. Yes, because you need the right tax advice to do that. And Chris Wilkins from Wilkins Southworth is somebody I started to work with closely over the last few months. And he saved me a fortune, helping me restructure things that I had structured maybe incorrectly at the start, etc. So could we have a huge round of applause for Chris Wilkins? Um, good afternoon. Um, what I thought I'd do is that, so this course is about create, being creative, and on our website it says it's not what you make, it's what you keep. So congratulations to all the people that's won awards, but wouldn't you be a bit annoyed if you've done all that hard work and you've got it in the wrong structure? So the most important thing is to plan how you're going to set up your business, and then make sure you've got it in the right entity, and once you've got it in that entity, you've got to review it. So it doesn't mean to say that what you do today should be there forever because tax changes, legislation changes, etc., etc. So let me give you an example of the type of thing we do. So to start with Wilkins Southworth, we act for Progressive Property, we act for Mark Homer, Rob Moore, Kevin, we act for the largest HMO in the country. So we get involved in a lot of sort of type of things that come across our desk that most accountants don't always do in that type of area. And we've done everything from we've acted for the largest telecommunications business in St. Petersburg, Russia, largest landowner in Bucharest, Romania. Not that you necessarily need that, but you never know what comes across your desk. So if you look at the website, one thing that may be relevant to you guys is an article I did called, um, it's about the guest house, and you just have to look. And what it was is that uh, we're having some um, uh, drinks one afternoon in our house, and my wife's friends came along. And I said, um, how's things? He said, oh, it's fantastic. Um, I've just retired, and I've bought a guest house. And I said, oh, that's good. Um, how, out of interest, how are, you, how are you structuring that? Oh, it's easy. I went to my accountant, and he said, we're going to set up a limited company. The company buys the guest house. And boom. And I said, oh, OK. Um, can you tell me a bit more about the situation? Yeah, well, what happened is that the wife and I, uh, we're going to sell our house, and that house will enable us, the money will enable us to buy the guest house. My wife doesn't work and I'm just retiring. And you're going to buy that in a limited company? Yeah. So why has your accountant done that? And he said, well, it's easy. You just stick it in the company. He said, OK, it is, it is easy. But when you think about it, and it doesn't take that long if you know what you're talking about, think, well, they're moving from their principal private residence. They're selling their house to go into a guest house. If that guest house is in a limited company, they can't climb private, private, private residence relief but they're going to live there. So part of that guest house would be free from tax anyway. But if it's in a limited company, they lose that exemption. What also is you get a letting exemption. A letting exemption is up to £40,000. And in the old days, you, didn't actually, you, you could actually own a house, then let it out. Then when you sold the house, the last 36 months were free from capital gains tax. Then it went down to 18. Now it's nine months. So the last nine months of selling a property that you lived in and rented out or the other way around, is free from capital gains tax. But also, you could claim a letting exemption. The new letting exemption is you have to live in the house. 
well, that's great, because they live in the guest house. So they've got the PPR relief, because I'm telling them not to buy in the limited company. And by the way, I think we've saved them probably a quarter of a million pounds just for that conversation. And then, so then he lives in the guest house. So they live in the guest house. They own the guest house in their own name, so they can claim part of that PPR relief. So that will be exempt from capital gains tax, the bit they live in. Part of it they rented out. They'll claim £40,000 capital gains tax relief on that. Then, then I started chatting to him. I said, well, are you going to make a profit? Well, not in the first year. It's always difficult in the first year, so we're going to probably make a loss. OK. So then there's another piece of legislation that says that if you start a business as a self-employed person, partnerships, tax the same, you can carry that loss back four years against your PAYE income, which you couldn't get if he was in a limited company, because the limited company would make the loss. But the loss is in his name. So therefore, his loss, we can offset against his PAYE refund, go back four years, and say he earned 100 grand and the loss is 20, I take that 20 grand back four years, so the tax bill for that year is to, on total tax bill income of 80, not 100, and then you get interest because you overpaid your tax bill four years ago. Um, anything else interesting about the guest house? Well, it'll need work on the boilers. I've got boilers, I've got lifts. Capital allowance relief. You can do capital allowances claims. We can then increase the loss, increase the loss in his own name. If it's a partnership with the wife, we did, I suggested the old 1890 Partnership Act. So when, while Bill Hickok was shooting up Dodge City, we were, we were having 1890 Partnership Acts in Britain. So it's not that long a piece of legislation, it's a great bit of legislation. The new legislation is limited liability partnerships, but they're taxed exactly the same. So if you've got a husband and wife, and the wife didn't have any income, then I want all the loss in the husband's name, because then I can offset it against PAY income. Under a Partnership Act, you can allocate the loss however you want. So there's nothing that says that the wife does just as much as work as a husband, so it's got to be split 50-50. If partners decide to split it 99-1, 50-50, that's their choice. So then we allocate 100% of the loss to the husband, which is increased by the capital allowances claim, and then you carry it back. So in this instance, I'm saying not a limited company. So that's the reason why you should have done it. What's wrong with a limited company? Well, let's say the guest house cost a million pounds. Got a million pound guest house in a legal entity, a limited company. We know that the rate of corporation tax has gone up to 25% from April this year on profits above 50,000 pounds. Therefore, if I have that guest house of a million pounds in a limited company, and let's say we tell it in 10 years' time, and let's stick with easy numbers, let's say we sell it for two million. So you've made a chargeable gain in the company of £1 million. So that £1 million in the company is going to be subject to corporation tax at 25%. So that's your quarter of a million gone straight away. Then it's sitting in the limited company. But I want that money. So how do I get that money? Well, I've got to take it out by dividend or salary, which again will be subject to income tax because it's in the company. So I want it in my hands. So I take it out that way. But then what happens if I just borrow the money from the company? Well, if I borrow the money from the company, the government say, well, I'm not getting any tax on dividend tax, and I'm not getting any tax on PAYE, so I'm going to hit you with something called Section 455 tax. Little number that just rolls off the tongue. But what it means is the company, if the individual, so the company lends money to a connected party, so a close company, five members or less, five shareholders, predominantly um, shareholder directors, if they borrow money from their limited company and that loan isn't repaid within nine months of the end of the year, the government wants basically a third of that loan in tax. And they'll just sit on it. It's not, it's not, you'll never get it back. You will get it back. But you have to repay the loan. And then you get the money back nine months after the end of the year in the accounting year that's been repaid. So in the meantime, the company has lost that money because the government say, if you didn't borrow it from your company, you'd borrow it from someone else. And you'd have to pay interest. So then the government, you'll have a P11D benefit in kind charge for interest that you've borrowed from your limited company. So basically, if you want money out of your company, the company in this instance has made a million pounds by selling the property. The, the money still sits in the company. The company then pays 25% corporation tax on the chargeable gain. And then you've got to get the money out of the company. So you've got corporation tax 
and income tax. So what Kevin was saying about restructuring is you then want to think, would there have been a better entity for me? And so the entities, there are different choices as to how you buy properties. And my advice would change completely depending on the type of entity you're buying, such as if are you aware of uh, Clause 24 that George Osborne brought out in 2015? Okay. So just for those that aren't, prior to that, let's assume we've got a, a, a guy that earns £150,000 on PAY in 2015. And I say £150,000 because that's a cusp. Above that, any pound above that, you're paying 45% tax. Beneath that, it's 40%. However, there is a sort of kicker that if you earn more than £100,000, your personal allowance is reduced by one pound for each two pound of income you earn over 100,000. So that means that if I earn 125,000 pounds, personal allowance is at 12,570, but let's say 12,500 times two, 25,000. 100,000 plus 25,000 is 125. So if I earn 125,000, I lose my 12,500 pounds tax free. So everyone can earn 12,570 pound tax free. However, you lose that if you earn more than £100,000, and if you earn more than £125,000, you lose the whole lot. So then you're straight into tax. If you earn more than £150,000, you're into 45% tax. So back in 2015, <coughs> if I had a rental property, so I've got PAY income of £150,000. If I had a rental property that had £10,000 rental income, and let's assume my only expense is mortgage interest of £10,000. So on my rental property, my Profit is zero. £10,000 rent, £10,000 mortgage interest. Therefore, I pay no tax in 2015. Fast forward to 2023, what happens now, I'm earning £150,000 on PAYE. My £10,000 rental income is taxed at £45,000, 45%. My £10,000 mortgage interest, I only get tax relief at 20%. So I've got a tax bill on a property that makes no profit. So You've got to think how you structure it with regards to your partners in the business. It may be that there's another partner in the business, you want to take advantage of that. So let's assume that I'm still earning £150,000 on PAYE, and let's assume my wife isn't earning anything, and we buy a property together. So HMRC say, if you buy it together, then you're going to be taxed 50-50. But the trouble is I know that I won't get the 45% tax relief on my half of the mortgage interest. However, if it was taxed on my wife, it would be because my wife doesn't use her basic rate tax ban, she doesn't use a 20% tax ban. So if the first £12,500 is tax free, the net anything from 12500 to 50000 we know is taxed at 20% for basic rate taxpayers. So that's on earned income or rental income. So what I want to do is with my property, I want it all taxed on the wife. So how do I avoid that? Well, what you can do is to start with, which is why the tax advice has to be in advance, not in arrears. So that's why you need to start talking to people ahead of any deals you do, not in arrears, because otherwise you're trying to unravel something that's already in place. But if you buy the property as tenants in common, that means you're allowed to split the profits between the two of you. You then have a declaration of trust. It's not a massive document, one page, two pages at most. And that says that Mr. and Mrs. Wilkins, Mrs. Wilkins has the profit, and then I do a Form 17, and the Form 17 lets HMRC know that that profit is going to the wife, not to me. So that means on that rental profit property that we both own together, it's all taxed on her, which is what I want, because I'm a 45% taxpayer and any pound I earn above my PAYE income is £150,000. So it will go in that direction. If, conversely, my wife and I bought a commercial property, so I'm going to, let's just say I'm going to buy a shop and rent it out, then am I worried about Clause 24? No. The reason is there's no restriction on mortgage interest from tax relief Clause 24 only affects residential property. Am I worried about paying 28% capital gains tax? Because the property we've just bought is in joint names. So 28% is the highest rate of capital gains tax for residential property. But 
If you buy commercial property, shares, anything like that, the highest rate of capital gains tax is 20%. So commercial property, it's sort of got a couple of ticks for me because I'm getting 100% tax relief on the mortgage interest, even though I'm a 45% taxpayer, and when I sell the property, I'm only paying 20% capital gains tax. So the concerns I had for buying a residential property are different for commercial. Now, residential property is going to be exempt from VAT because residential rental income is an exempt supply. Commercial property, not necessarily. It depends if the property had been opted to tax. So then it may be that I've got a VAT situation I need to bear in mind. So why would I want to buy a commercial property in my own name, not in a limited company? Well, sorry? No, it's, it's, it's not wrong. I was, just, I was thinking of something else. If I buy it in my own name, I know that the highest rate of capital gains tax for a commercial property is 20%. What's the rate of corporation tax? 25%, because my profit on the sale of that is going to be more than £50,000. And then if it's in the company, what Kevin was alluding to, is you've got double tax. I've got the asset in the company, then I've got to get it out of the company and pay income tax. I've already paid 25% corporation tax. So why would I want to have a corporation tax bill and an income tax bill? Now, there could be arguments, depending on your scenario, but let me sort of make it simple. So let's start off at the easy ones. I know that when I exit on the commercial property, if it's in my own name, at the moment, the current legislation is 20%. Well, that's cheaper than having it in a company, and I'm not going to pay double tax. And I'm going to get 100% tax relief on the mortgage interest at whatever rate of tax I pay, because there's no restriction. And what this gentleman said, cap allowance as well. So I did a, um, if, if you ever uh, have the time to look at our website, Mark came to our office, Mark Homer, we had a chat, and I explained exactly how we bought our building. So can anyone give me some ideas of the different type of entities that you would have to buy a property asset? What, what sort of... Sorry? LLP. LLP, Limited Liability <laughs> Partnership, yep. Any more? Limited company. Limited, com limited company, yep, good idea. Anything else? Partnership. Sorry? Partnership. partnership, that is taxed the same as Limited Liability Partnership. So a simple partnership, 1890, if my wife buy a property today, we are joint owners, joint venturers, and we're taxed the same as an LLP. An LLP, Limited Liability Partnership, is a look-through. So what it means is that entity doesn't pay tax in its own name. You allocate the profits in the LLP and they're taxed on the individual members of the LLP or partners. So you sort of look through and then you allocate the profits. But what you're not doing in an LLP and you're not doing in a partnership is you're not paying corporation tax and income tax. You're only paying LLPs, sole traders, joint venturers, whatever you call themselves, they're only paying income tax. Limited company pays corporation tax and then for you to get the money out, you're going to pay income tax. So you pay corporation tax at probably 25%, and then income tax. So what, what we want to do is you want to look at what someone, a vehicle someone's got. So if, for the sake of argument, I spoke to a guy, and he said, I've got a limited company, and the profits are 250 grand, and I live on the 250. I need the 250 profit to live on. So that limited company we know, and this could be just a, a service industry, industry, someone that provides services, so management services, whatever it is, and the company makes £250,000 profit, and I know that the guy needs all that money to live on. So the company's paid 25% corporation tax, and the chances are at that level of income he's paying a minimum of 33%, probably 39.35% tax on dividend because of the rate of his income. So you're looking at someone that's paying 64% tax, corporation tax plus income tax. But it, as he needs all the money to live on, how about we just tax it as an LLP, partnership, sole trader, whatever, whatever. And then you're only going to pay income tax. The highest rate of income tax is 45%. Well, it's still cheaper than... Yeah. So, so you need to sort of look at it. And the, the whole thing is, is that, as I said on our website, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. And you'd be really annoyed if you've done all that hard work with all these properties and you've got it in the wrong entity. Because you've got it in the wrong entity, you're suffering enormous amounts of tax when you don't have to because you haven't planned. Now, 
Yes, Hamish. How are you feeling since you've changed over as you have got the online So, um, I don't know if you know, but I drove from London today. So our office is in London. And I got lost on the North Circular. And I saw this guy walking along the pavement. And I said, I'm sorry, I've just been going round in circles on the North Circular. I've got to get to Peterborough. Do you know how to get there? And he said, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> now, that, that is the trouble. You've got to plan in advance. You can get out of it, yes. But the trouble is it's difficult. So I, let me give you an example. I had a client that came to me and he said, I've got this limited company, it's fantastic. And my accountant set it up. And we looked at it and he had one share. So he owned 100% of the company himself. He was married, had kids of over 18. And I said, well, have you thought of your being taxed at I don't know, 200 grand? How about we give a dividend to the wife and the kids? And you can have that. And then your wife, rather than you being taxed on 200 grand, you, your wife, if she had the other share, she could be taxed on 100. Neither of you would lose your personal allowance. You wouldn't be into 45% tax. She doesn't use a tax-free allowance of 12,500 and doesn't use a basic rate tax band. He said, fantastic. But the only trouble is, you've got to change the memorandum and articles of the association to do it, to issue new class of shares. All possible, but it costs money. And it's easier if... On day one, he'd come to us, which he hadn't. It, everything is possible, it's just it comes at a price. So then we, what we did is we basically chucked out the old memorandums and articles of association and reconfigured the new ones to have different classes of shares. If you've got different classes of shares, you can have dividends to different people. And then you can utilise their basic rate tax bands. And ideally, what you don't want is... Mr Bloggs having 50 shares, Mrs Bloggs having 50 shares, because then he and her have to have the same dividend. If you've got different class of shares, A, B, C, D, that one can have a dividend of 10 grand, that can have a dividend of £2.50, that can have £3.60, whatever you want. But you've got full, full ability to change it as you want. But if you don't sort of... I think it's Donald Brunsfeld says there's the known knowns and the unknown knowns. And the trouble you've got is that if you go to an advisor that knows that much, they ain't going to know that much, and that's the problem. And then it's that bit that saves you the tax. Because what you need to do is you need to plan for the future. Now, you might say, yeah, but when I went to him, I was single. Now I'm married and I've got kids. Yeah, well, how about we set up fourth class of shares then? It's no skin off your nose to do it then. It's just then you've got the flexibility to do it forwards. And a lot of this stuff is that if your advisor doesn't know what they don't know, they ain't going to know how to advise you. That's the trouble. So... It, it's horses for courses, really, and if you're not going to people who know what they're talking about, then you're not going to get the advice. So with a lot of this stuff, like I say, with the um, lecture I did with Mark when we did the podcast, it's on our, we've got a YouTube site, you can have a look at it if you're, if you're inclined. I even got one with Rob, actually, for about an hour. That's a bit long. Um, so that one explains the different points, and I explained why it would be better for us to buy our office the way we did. And then you give the options. So one of the things that hasn't come up in this conversation is pension funds. So you may want to buy a building in a pension fund. You can't buy residential property, but it may be commercial. And that may not be my first choice, but it may be that the answer is, I'm sorry, but I haven't got any money, and all the money's sitting in the pension fund. So we use that entity, because that's the entity that's got the cash to buy the asset. How do we make it work? If we then go back to my comment, it's not set in stone. So let's just say you guys are going really great guns and you start off with one property in your own name, which is the ideal thing. You get married, so then we do something with the wife. Then you, find, then you come back to me in a few years' time and say, Chris, I've got 60 properties and Section 24 is crucifying me. I'm a high-rate taxpayer. I'm only getting 20% tax relief and the income tax is expensive. Then you might want to, then you might say, can I utilise Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey? Anyone heard of Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey? Section 162 incorporation relief. So Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey, what happened is she um, lived in Ireland and she had 10 uh, rental properties. Uh, one flat, 10 properties. Five were rented out and um, 
she um, used to vet the tenants coming in. She checked them, um, did the cleaning. Um, she did all the maintenance. She repaired fences, cleared the rubbish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, if I've got one um, property, one rental property, and I sell it to my limited company, so I've got a brand new limited company, and I sell my property there, then I've crystallised the capital gain. I sell my one property that's now owned by my one limited company. So no cash has changed. The only trouble is I've created a capital gain because I've moved that asset from my name to the limited company name. Well, there will be stamp duty, but there's also capital gains tax. And I've crystallised the, crystal the capital gains tax on one of those properties that you bought really cheaply, fantastic, save for 200,000, now worth a million, 800,000 pounds at 28%. And all I've done is put it in my limited company because I didn't want, I wanted to avoid clause 24, the income tax problem. So Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey had 10 properties. So she said, I'm putting it in a limited company. Now, the question is, is that a business? Now, there's no definition of what a business is in the Taxes Act. But if I want to claim incorporation relief, I've got to have a business. So if you can think of a sliding scale, one property at that end, uh, that's not a business, that's residential rental income, which is passive income. It's not, a, it's not a business and it's certainly not a trade. On the other hand, I've got clients with 60 properties. They've got staff, they've got agents, everything. Well, that definitely is a business. Now, where along that scale does it become a business? Because once it becomes a business, I then want to claim Section 162 relief. So Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey lost the case. And the judge said, well, actually, um, this would be subject to business property relief. You wouldn't get business property relief. Business property relief is a relief you can claim under the inheritance tax relief when you die. So you're not having it tough. So that's the first tier tribunal. Her son then appealed to the upper tribunal. The upper tribunal is, I guess, akin to the old House of Lords. So then um, it was heard before Judge Berner, and he reviewed the case. He said, well, I don't understand this business property relief because you pay capital gains tax when you're alive and inheritance tax when you die. So business property relief isn't relevant because it's not a relevant subject. You'd only pay that if you're dead, but you ain't dead. What you want to do is you want to move the properties into a limited company. So what, you actually, what do you actually do? So she explained what she physically did, vetted the tenants. How many hours do you, a week do you spend doing that? Well, I spend about 20 hours a week. Okay, and you've got how many properties? Well, I've got 10, five are, are tenanted at the moment. I said, okay, well, I think that is a business. So Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey then sets the precedent for incorporation relief. So if I've got five properties or 10 properties or more, and let's assume that I'm losing a lot of tax because of this new Clause 24, new because it came in 2016, it came in over four years, 25% each year, now got full effect. So I'm the 45% taxpayer, I'm going to get 20% tax relief on used to be called mortgage interest, now it's called excess residential finance costs. So you don't see mortgage interest in a set of rental accounts, it's in the tax comp as an offset against your tax bill at 20%. So because of section 162 incorporation relief, you've then flipped them into the limited company and you don't crystallise a capital gain. So you need to sort of constantly keep your portfolio under review because as circumstances change, as tax changes, you'll find that the situation changes and therefore it becomes more relevant to you and you might find that something is better for you than it used to be. I don't know, you're, you might um, split up with a wife, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So every, as things change, you need to adapt. And what you need to do is make sure that your advisor adapts with you so that the advice you get is relevant to all the circumstances that you need. So in this case, what they do is they got it in the limited company. Now, what you've just got to bear in mind is that really there's two things that, you, that would go through my mind. So Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey, if we fast forward to today, because Section 24 wasn't an issue when this happened. But what I've done is the reason I wanted to incorporate is because I was losing as much tax relief on the mortgage interest. So therefore, my income tax liability was greater than it would otherwise be because of the loss of tax relief on mortgage interest. I put it in the limited company, I've avoided that. 
However, I then go back to my earlier comment, I've now got the properties in a limited company. So therefore, upon exit, I'm going to have a chargeable gain in the company and then take it out. And, that, and so therefore, putting it in the company, you might want to do some mitigation with family members for owning shares in the company, et cetera, et cetera, to sort of mitigate that potential capital gains bill by spreading the risk. So the, you've just got to expand your knowledge so make sure that you're not just thinking about income tax because on exe exit, you know that you're going to have corporation tax and income tax once it's in a company. So there's a few more things that you need to sort of grapple with. And it's just a case of looking at the whole family situation. And sometimes we're doing tax planning for like five years, seven years time on day one because you need to consider whether there may be certain inheritance tax reliefs you want to claim. There may be certain capital gains tax reliefs, and some of these reliefs crystallise in five, seven years' time. So you need to sort of consider how you're going to do the planning. But what I'm saying is the most important thing is that the structure of your business is vital to how you actually exit this, because the most important thing is, going back to our website, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. And all that hard work could go out the window with your fantastic purchase prices, if we haven't got it right. So, and, and it may be that you say, actually, I'm putting that property in the limited company, that one in a joint venture with the builder, that one in with my wife and I, and that may be a good structure for you. But, so it may be that you have a different number of entities to take advantage of different scenarios. But, so, for the sake of argument, say I buy one property out of my redundancy money then that might not have a mortgage. So I might want that in my name. I might then have a mortgage on the next property of the wife. So that one, I might put, the, put it in the wife's name. Tenants in common, declaration of trust, form 17. If you don't do all of that lot, it won't work. The form 17 has to be done in advance, not in arrears. So that means that from the year ended, let's say, year ended 5th of April 24, I've got to have it in place before 6th of April 23. So it's got to be there in advance so that HMRC know that I want that set up so that the profits go in the wife's name. So I've got to do some forward tax planning. I've got to know what I'm going to earn at the end of the year and my wife's going to earn for that scenario. And then I might say, well, actually, on the next one, I've got a, um, a deal with a builder or something. That one I'll put in a limited company. So it's just a case of how you want to structure it. So... What I thought is, by sort of setting the scene, I don't know if there's any sort of questions that come out of that that anyone would like to sort of follow up on. Yes, Adam. Hello. Hello. Um, so two questions. First one's a short, easy one, and it might be a bit of a silly question. But as a tax advisor, are you also the accountant, or do we then get an accountant that you would no, work no. with? We, we do the accounts for progressive property and the tax. So we are registered auditors. Okay. So um, I'm a fellow of the Chartered Certified Accountants and we're registered auditors. So we can audit limited companies. We do the accounts. We, do, we can do the audits. We do the tax. And the most important thing is that the accounts of an entity are prepared under GAP, generally accepted accounting principles. And if you don't get the account structure right, <coughs> the tax sort of follows on. So the whole thing about the accounts is the basis upon which you prepare the accounts is the bit that's been taxed. So to give you an idea, if you've got a limited company, let's say that I've got a turnover of um, 15 million pounds, I've got nine staff, and I've got no assets. Would that be a micro company, a small company, or a large company? I like the other side. <laughs> that is a micro company. And the reason is it's a micro company is that it falls under something called FRS 105. And FRS 105 says that there's three rules, basically. You can breach one rule, but not more than one. So the turnover can't be more than £632,000. You can't have more than 10 staff. And your assets, balance sheet assets, fixed assets plus current assets, can't be more than 316000 So the turnover could be £20 million. But as long as you've got less than 10 staff and your assets are less than 316,000, you're a micro company. If you're a micro company, you don't have to do revaluation reserves. You don't do revaluation reserves, 
It avoids, you do less notes to the accounts, um, and the presentation of the accounts are different from the next level up, which is FRS 102. So if you then bear in mind, so sometimes a client will come to me and say, he's done the accounts, can you do the tax? And I said, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. <coughs> but, yeah. So yeah, we can do the accounts and the tax. Okay, thank you. And the second part is... Sorry, um, long answer to easy question. No, it's fine. Um, it's going back to what you were saying about how you guys bought your building for your practice. Um, so I'm in a similar position where I need to get a commercial unit for my other business. So are you suggesting that it might be ideal to buy that in a personal name and then essentially lease it to the company um, to kind of benefit from those, those tax advantages? So have you got a limited company? Limited company. It's a service company, yeah. Okay. So what you've got to think about, and it's explained a bit more in that YouTube video, Mark, mm -hmm. is if I bought it in the company, I know that when I sell that property, it's a company asset. Mm -hmm. And if the profits for that year are more than £50,000, I'm going to pay 25% corporation tax. I'm going to pay 25% on the profit yeah. in that. However, because it's a commercial property, I know that if I owned it in my own name, the maximum rate of capital gains tax is 20%. So we're save 5% straight away. Okay. The next stage is the profit is going to sit in the company. So I'm going to get it out of the company because I want to spend it. Mm. Well, then I'm going to pay income tax on the dividend or salary that's paid to me by the company to get it in my hands. So the company's already paid 25% corporation tax on the profit. If the property is in my name, I'm going to pay 20% capital gains tax, and it's my money. I put it straight in my back pocket after paying 20%. The company's money I can't touch because it's not mine. So I then got to get it out of the company, which creates the income tax bill. So the company's already paid 25% on the profit, on the sale of that property. Makes sense. Thank you. Now, there may be other criteria. So other criteria are sometimes non-tax criteria, <laughs> such as it's in a... Um, I've got... My tenant is the biggest nightmare tenant, and he might sue me. So you might say, well, I want the protection of a veil of incorporation because the landlord is the limited company. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the tenant would sue the limited company, not sue me. So there's other criteria to bear in mind, but I'm only talking about tax. So as my own, as my own tenant, I'm probably not going to sue myself. So <laughs> if you are the tenant, <laughs> yeah, probably being so the if you are the tenant <laughs> what I would do is I go to the bank and I say, I want to buy some money. And he says, but you haven't got any you haven't got any deposit or anything. Yeah, but I've got a great tenant. Who's the tenant? Well my limited company. Yeah. So my limited company has a turnover of X mm -hmm. and here's the accounts of the limited company. So the company can can afford to pay me the rent and that rent will be used to pay the mortgage. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> that helps loads. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, pleasure. Sorry. I'll I'll right past the microphone. Um, it's actually a question for a client um, who uh, the setup of the scenario has a limited company that owns two properties. They were until are they residential or commercial? Yeah, residential. Both of them were both until recently rented out on ASTs. Uh, he's done a big refurb on one and has discovered uh, loads of asbestos. So the refurb cost has been significantly more than he anticipated. And so now to improve the cash flow and pay that back, he's looking at doing SA with one of the properties. Um, so I have advised him firstly that he needs proper tax advice but I've already suggested to him that um, he would want the trading income from a service accommodation property in a different structure, a different company potentially from a, a property that's generating income from as an AST on an investment basis so my kind of a, a suggestion I put to him to investigate and I'll ask you is um, What's the best way of doing it? I suggested maybe if he created a subsidiary company, wholly owned by the by the existing company, that he might be able to transfer the service accommodation property down into that. And I don't know if there's either capital gains or, or tax implications of doing that if it stays within the same <coughs> overall company ownership but in a separate and discrete company entity that could then potentially act as a as a trading company with service accommodation income. Also, when and how can he reclaim the refurb and reno uh, re renovation expenses that have become a necessity far over and above just a, a redeck because of the discovery of asbestos and therefore significant structural works. Well, what your suggestion is, is uh, you, you won't actually save any tax by doing that because you're still in a limited company, but what you've done is set up a group. Mm -hmm. So you've got a wholly owned subsidiary and a parent. Yeah. So. You're still going to be in the, in the realms of corporation tax. 
the expenses you're, incur you're incurring are tax deductible against the trading profits of the business. Um, but what you're probably doing is, is ring fencing it, ring fencing that because it's a sub subsidiary of that company. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the service accommodation, what I'd be thinking of is whether you have to be, um, whether it's vatable, whether it's a trade. Um, you will be able to claim capital allowances, presumably, if you've got a capital allowance consultant on that. Um, but separately, you don't want to, ha has he thought about get, buying the property in his own name? No, he already owns them in the name of the limited company. So, if so he doesn't own them in his own name? Well, no, correct. But so they're owned so by the limited company. Is that an option? Um, possibly. I mean, all I'm saying is, ultimately, and, and if you think about it ultimately, y you will end up paying 25% corporation tax on the chargeable gain. So it's just a case of you might want to just think about w whether there are any other options and when you want to take it out of the company. Right. It, it, it's partly as well to avoid, if he transfers the ownership, if he bought it himself, then the limited company would have a capital gains liability on the uplift from when he bought it, which was many, many years ago. So it, the, the kind of part of the question is, can he transfer the, bis the, the property that's now going to be doing serviced accommodation into a, a subsidiary without creating a capital gains liability because it's not Yeah, you can transfer assets in a group. Right. As long as it's 75% group, you can transfer it without crystallizing gain. Okay. But, but I would just question the, the fact that you're saying you're going to crystallize a chargeable gain. The gain may be diminished by the fact that I've got some clients mm -hmm. that just can't get a mortgage because of cladding. Mm -hmm. And it may be that the property is significantly reduced in value. I've got some clients that that, uh, that are trying to buy properties that have cladding issues and they can't get mortgages. And then, therefore, that property has a diminution in value. And therefore, that may be the ideal time to buy it. Right. Because it will create, it might have either extinguished or significantly reduced the potential chargeable gain in a limited company. Are you here for a question? So what you'll find is that the answers that that, that answer encompassed VAT, corporation tax, group relief on capital gains, and capital gains tax relief on for individuals. So when you get an answer, you want to make sure that whoever you're talking to is capable of knowing that much, not that much, otherwise you ain't going to get the right answer. I'm not saying that's the right answer, but it's starter for it. Hi. Um, what's your thought about um, setting offshore companies to kind of offset some taxes or get, what's the tax benefits of um, setting companies offshore? What country? Uh, Dubai in particular. To Dubai. Okay, so you have a Dubai company that owns what? Um, uh, well, it's a construction company in Dubai, actually, and they want to open um, a second branch for it in here and, and start uh, owning properties in the okay. UK. Okay, so you've got a Dubai company that's going to own UK residential property. Um, um, what do you think it will mitigate? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. So what, what would be... Um, if if do, do we set an, a, a second branch for it in the UK? or keep it as a Dubai company and owning assets in the UK? So now we get into in international tax. So international tax, have we got a double da taxation treaty with Dubai? I think the answer is no. But does it really matter? No. And the reason is, I think from 2015, residential property is subject to UK capital gains tax irregardless who the owner is. So if the owner is a non-UK resident, you're still going to pay UK capital gains tax on it. The sale of a UK residential property, um, you have to pay the tax within 60 days of the completion of that. So you have to pay your, in the old days, I'd film a tax return in and pay the tax on the 31st of January after the year ended 5th of April. Now you have to pay that tax within 60 days. The well, next question is, I've got a Dubai company and uh, let's say I've got a trade in the UK. So I ain't going to pay any UK corporation tax, is the argument. Unfortunately, if the company is managed to control from the UK, the ownership doesn't matter. If it was that simple, Kevin would be writing his checks for his accountancy bills to Wilkins South of Dubai Limited. 
But because I'm sitting in Barnes, South West London, and my business is managed and controlled from Barnes, it doesn't matter who owns the business, I'm subject to UK corporation tax on that income. So that wouldn't avoid it. You can use things like transfer pricing, but that ain't going to work for residential property. That's a capital gain. So UK properties are going to have to declare that profit, that profit trading profit, capital gains profit, in the UK, irregardless of who the owner is. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Hello. That should be an easy one. Okay. It's about uh, BAT. Um, I was discussing on Tuesday um, with colleagues here uh, the treatment of BAT, and then I talked to my accountant and told me something completely different. Um, if you have an SA, it can be your management or rent to SA. How do you count the 85K turnover? How is it counted? Is it different if it's SA management or SA rent to rent? So, for example, you get 3K in bookings, uh, but you pay rent 1.5K. Um, is it different that how do you account for the BAT, the 85,000 for BAT? Is the, um, is the rental income over 85? No, but the turnover is, isn't it? What's the turnover? Uh, the money that you make in bookings. No, what is the physical figure? Where Let's imagine it? that is 90. Okay. What, what, what do you do then? Because... So, what you've got to consider is let's go back to what, what, how I started. Um, and I started by telling you about the guest house. So, residential rental income is passive income and is exempt from VAT. However, if I'm, c if I'm running a business or a trade, such as a guest house, I'm providing services, then that means that it's subject to VAT. Now, what you'll have to do, your your, I won't be able to do your justice to your question in detail, but what the problem you'll find is that if HMRC consider you are running a trade, then mm -hmm. it's VATable. It's a limited company. Sorry? It's doesn't a limited. Make a difference. It doesn't, doesn't make a difference. There's no okay. bearing. So yeah. if I have sole trader, partnership, limited company, the VAT thresholds are still 85,000 and the rules are the same. It's just a case of what you do. And if it's passive, I'm not providing any services, then basically it's residential rental income. If I'm providing a trade, the problem you've got is that, that HMRC may consider that that is a trade subject to 85,000 and you should be VAT registered. And if you fall within that, then you're going to part, it's going to cost you another 20%. So A, um, if you think you fall within that group, you want to keep your turnover to 85,000 and not go above it. Um, or you might want to do sli something slightly different. So, if I explain to you, Elizabeth Moyne Ramsey, the first judge at the first judge tribunal said um, you wouldn't qualify for business property relief. Business property relief is an inheritance tax rule, and what that means is that should you sell, when you die, your assets are subject to inheritance tax unless you can claim reliefs. So, if I run a trading business, I would claim business property relief on the shares in that business, which means if I leave them to say anyone other than my wife, it will be exempt from inheritance tax. What you'll find is some people run businesses such as guest houses, serviced accommodation, provide other services. It's very difficult to do, but there have been a couple that, that are classed as businesses. And they want to be classed as a business because when they sell it, and when they die, sorry, it's exempt from inheritance tax. So you're, you're running a fine line between vatable um, BPR relief, etc. So you've got, if, if you're on 90,000, you think it's going to be vatable, you could try and Well, I'm it. still under, but if I get another property, I will be above. So the question is, I am getting or not. So if, if you do SA management, it's exactly the same. Now, if you charge 15%, it's exactly the same that to get the full rent. Is that correct? Well, what you, you've got to be slightly careful in that. In the old days, when I used to, when I was a trainee accountant, and I used to go to the pub with the boss, the husband would sell me the pint of the beer, and the wife would sell me the ham sandwich. And the reason is they, they were running two businesses in the pub. 
the beer is vatable and the ham sandwiches weren't. Um, now you have something called aggregation rules, and aggregation rules say that if you're not careful, you can have them together. The other way is you could uh, outsource the management, and then that management may be a smaller element of the total income, and it may be that if you outsource that, the vatable bit goes out and the rental income of the 85 keeps in. I think it's how the question's been asked as well. So, uh, with just with love, um, there's two things to think about, just because I know these guys. <laughs> One is rent to rent, yeah, where they rent the property for the 1,500 quid and rent it out again, and the profit in their company is income minus cost, but the turnover, excuse my crap writing, is everything that came in, yeah, and turnover. But then he's also doing management, but not for himself. He's managing a property belonging to a total stranger. And that money would be in a client account, and then the income might be 5K, but he's charging 15%. So whatever that is, 150, it don't matter, 550 or whatever. 750. 750. And the other 4,250 is going that way to a completely different stranger. Should they not just be two separate companies? And if they're the same company, only the 750 is added to this, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, what I'd be doing... I think his question is, is this 5,000 every month? Let's say one of these properties is making two grand a month, turnover. Is this turnover seven grand a month? Or is, turno is this turnover 2,750? That's his question. Yeah. I, I, would, I would be keeping that separate from that because you're running two businesses. That one would be exempt, that one would be vatable. If you keep that as a separate business, perhaps in, if you were married, the wife's name or something like that, then you're providing different services to different people, you're not lumping them all together. But I don't, th but that, that doesn't suddenly become vatable because it's an exempt supply, because you're renting a property. If you're, if you yeah, keep- I, I am the manager, so I'm both. If you're managed, well, I would keep that separate. So to give you an idea, I've got a client who's um, fits kitchens. And he came to me and he said, I'm worried that my turnover is going over 85,000. And I said, well, what's your turnover? And he said, well, I, I go out and I buy B&Q kitchens. The a client gives me the money. And it's that bit. And then I fit them. And that means I'm over 85,000 pounds. So what we did, we said, well, OK, how about the client gives you the 5,000 pounds for the kitchen. We put that in a client account. You then go out and buy the kitchen with that client account money. So therefore, it's never touched your bank account because it's not your money. And what that is the same thing as there. The bit you're but missing is the client account, which is the bit I told you guys to set up. <coughs> you keep a separate, you have taken everything into your business account. Yeah. No, you meant to have the client account, the separate account. So in this scenario, what happens is the client gives you the 5,000 pounds. That goes into my client account, bank account. I go to B&Q and buy a kitchen for 5,000 pounds. So that money is not my money, it's in my client bank account. So you've got an office account and a client account. So kitchen fitter office account, kitchen fitter client account. Client pays £5,000 into the office account. You go and use the £5,000 to go to B&Q. That's not your income, never has been. You've used the money, it's on behalf of the customer. So the only vatable income is that account, which is the office account. And that's for supplying services. Okay. Okay. Any more for any more? Sorry, uh, come on. Well, One second, no microphone. Right. Mike's gone that way. Gone that way. Mike's okay. turn. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, just a scenario um, that I might find myself in, possibly. Um, so, I understand that if I have a, um, a rental property with tenants on an AST, uh, and then I refurb that property, I can offset that to an extent against the rental income. Um, what if I have a residential property with um, lodgers on excluded license agreements as opposed to ASTs? Well, you live in the property. And I live in the property. Uh, it's your pro you own it personally. So, yep. Uh, or, 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 yes, yes. Okay. Only personally in my name. And uh, then we decide to let that property 
uh, uh, having done a refurb to let it, is that refurb tax deductible against the rental income in that scenario? Uh, because I, or is it, would it be considered a capital um, expense? Okay, so um, I, like, I like the question. The reason I like the question is you live in the property. So the property is exempt from capital gains tax as your principal private residence to the extent that <coughs> you live in that element of the property. The bit you don't live in, because the new legislation HMRC has, has brought in with letting exemptions, is the letting exemption is as long as you live in the property, you can claim a £40,000 letting exemption upon exit, maximum of £40,000. There's three ways of doing the calculations. And the last nine months of ownership of that property are free from capital gains tax. So if you said, actually, I'm going to sell the property on the 30th September 2024, you can move out of it on the 1st of January 24 on the assumption you haven't got another property, and that last nine months, you could be out of the property completely and could be free from capital gains tax. With regards to um, the qu your question, what you've got to think about is, does the word start RE? Is it a repair? Is it a renewal? Is it a replacement? If the answer is yes, then it's subject to um, uh, relief in your income tax computation. So, if, for the sake of argument, I've got a room that's a bedroom and I um, put wallpaper on it, I'm replacing existing wallpaper. If I change the carpets, I'm replacing existing carpets. If, conversely, I've made a brand new room, let's say it's a conservatory, that is a capital expense because it wasn't there before. So the difference is, is are you repairing, renewing, replacing something that's already there, irregardless of the state of it? So if you buy a property that's in a tardy condition and it had a bad kitchen, if you replace it broadly like for life, as a B&Q kitchen, kitchen, you have a Howden's kitchen, then you're replacing one that's already there. So to the extent that that is part of your business, i.e. that expense relates to the income you're claiming the relief for and you're declaring, then it's tax deductible. If you stick a room in the roof or a conservatory, that's a capital expense because the house didn't have a conservatory or a room in the roof before. And then that expense you deduct from capital gains tax if you have a capital gains tax bill. But the thing I like about your scenario is you use lots of capital gains reliefs that you can claim because you live in the property. You can claim £7,500 rent a room relief, which means that the first £7,500 of rent that you receive from your property is exempt. <coughs> so certain ways of doing that. Uh, depending on what the expenses are, you might not want to claim that relief. If your expenses are higher, you may, you may do it under the normal way. But there's lots of capital gains relief, income tax relief that you can claim on that scenario. That's very good news. Thank you very much. Good. Pleasure. Who's next? All right. Um, I've got a question with regards to transfer of funds between two entities. So, for example, if you have one entity, which is a limited company, and uh, the other entity is a property uh, entity. So in order to fund the purchase of the uh, assets. Sorry, limited company under what? Um, so mm -hmm. one is a limited company, which is like a normal What's business. The other, the other, uh, other company is also a limited company, okay. uh, but property company. Okay. So you move the fund from the business company to the property company so that the asset could be bought. Um, is that the right way to transfer it, or should it be structured in a particular way? I've not, so you've got two limited companies. Yeah. One owns a property. Yeah. And you want to move that property from that company to that company? Um, no, no, sorry. A normal business com normal company that uh, does provide service, it makes, you know, it has the assets, that funds, and that fund is transferred to the property company so that you can utilize the funds to buy the assets within the property company. Yep. Um, the transaction that, could you transfer it as a normal loan or? Yes. So yeah. the, the companies aren't in a group, are they? They're not part of the group, no. Okay. So you can lend money between limited companies without the crystallization of tax charge. They don't have to charge interest. The problem you've got is if the company pays interest to, say, an individual, you HMRC say that if you pay the interest, you must deduct tax. And that tax has to be declared on a quarterly basis in a form called a CT61. So let's say I lend money to your limited company 
and you pay me £6,000 a year interest. You stop 20% for that £6,000, you declare it on the CT61 on a quarterly basis and you pay that to HMRC. You then give me a form called an R185 that says that you stop 20% tax on that and I will use that tax credit against my tax bill. Okay? Okay, thank okay. you. What if, what if the interest is not paid at all? Sorry? What if interest is not paid at all? Well, if the interest is not paid, then there's, it, then there's nothing to declare on my tax return. But is, is, is there any particular structure to, to make that payment like a, a loan is the best way to, to well, if, if, if I personally lend that gentleman's limited company money, yeah. and if we agree that no interest is charged, then he doesn't pay me anything, and I don't, and I don't put anything on my tax return. If conversely he pays me interest, then his limited company has to stop tax on the interest <coughs> he pays me at 20%, and then I have to declare that on my tax return, uh, but he's already got to stop me 20% tax. That's a credit that I will claim on my tax return in the form of an R185. Right. Okay. Okay. You need a microphone. That lady as well had a question. Yeah. Um, how about if you don't pay that interest on a monthly basis, you roll it over until the end of the loan agreement? So when you pay the, the capital and the interest, yeah, so you only have to deduct the tax when you pay the interest. When you pay the interest, okay. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I just ask a clarifying question on that? Kevin's getting in quick rather than paying me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I know the answer, but just to clarify for the yeah, room, because yeah. the room do two types of things. Number one is they borrow money. So Damien's Limited Company will borrow money from another limited company. Yes. Or Damien's Limited Company borrows money from a person. Yes. What you've just spoke about is if you're borrowing money from a person, you have to withhold the tax. When you're paying interest to a person, you withhold the tax. If you're paying interest to another limited company, you don't withhold the tax. There's no tax. There's no tax. Okay, so now if you are charging interest to another limited company, company to company, then you would just pay the interest and that company would pay their own corporation tax bill. Yes. So don't confuse the two. So I just want to clarify that because that's personal borrowing from a person. You must with their it's the in, the interest you charge them. What Chris is saying is basically charged as if it was income as an employee. So you've got to with, re, retain the tax bit in your business, and you pay the tax for them. Yeah? So what you've got to bear in mind is if so, it's Damien. Yeah. So you paid me interest on your corporation tax return and on your accounts, you show that you've paid interest, but you don't show who it's paid to. So if you pay it to me, and I forget to declare it on my tax return, HMRC would never know. So what they say is you have an obligation to do something called withholding tax. And withholding tax says that you've got to stop the tax so that HMRC knows if I want the tax back, I declare it on my tax return and claim it back. So they therefore- They definitely get the well, you've got 20% of my, my money anyway because you've only given me 80% of my interest. So under withholding tax, that's, uh, and, you, and you're the one that's at fault. If you don't stop it, they'll come after you, not me. Raise your hand if you see the difference between borrowing from a person versus borrowing from a company. <coughs> borrowing from a person, you withhold the tax. Bor borrowing from a company, you just pay them the total amount of interest that's owed, whether it be your company or another company, if you charge interest. Uh, what about He's the tax pension? guy. <laughs> that way. Sorry? Is, it, is it different from SAS pension? Would that be the same as company? That way. If you borrow money from the SAS? Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, I think the pensioner trustee would have an obligation to charge you interest anyway. So there you would have to. Um, and whether they have to um, put tax, uh, I don't know, I should think so. I, right. I've just done a SAS loan for myself, my own SAS. 6% right now is the minimum. Um, interest if you're lending it to yourself because it's got to be 1% above base, basically. Okay. But, but you, yes, they, you charge interest, but you don't withhold tax, you pay it because a SAS is a c form of company. Yeah. Okay. It's not a person. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question about this uh, management and client account. Uh, you said that it needs to be run separately, like this management fee and your uh, turnover from rental, do you mean in, in two separate companies, or how do you keep it separate? I you said you need to separate it. I think the key is, is that is never your money, that is client money. So that goes into a client bank account. So therefore, that doesn't go in your accounts. Mm -hmm. 
So that, that goes in the client bank account and you discharge it and presumably 750 is what goes in your accounts, mm -hmm. not 5,000 pounds. And then therefore, if that bit is exempt from VAT, that bit's VATable. If you're running a business, oh. that is all VATable. It depends on its residential rental income or you're running a trade or a business. Okay, so one part of that will be VATable and that profit won't be VATable, so I'll have VATable and non-VATable things in business? Two different companies. One non-VATable company and one VATable company with a client account. But it is possible to be partially exempt. And partially exempt basically means is that a business could have some VATable supplies and some non-VATable supplies. But then you've got to be careful because the recovery of input VAT is, is on a similar basis. So you've got, so if I've got a business that's got some VATable income and some non-VATable income, then broadly the costs of that non-VATable income, I can't recover the VAT back from it, but I can on that. Is it lunchtime? Asha, is it lunchtime? Okay, because I've got one more, st it's, it's, we're, we're at lunchtime. So here's the answer to all of this, by the way. Um, I mentioned the answer at the start, and the answer was at the start is some people are penny wise and pound foolish. And what I mean by that is they hire a cheap accountant who costs them a fortune instead of hiring a tax advisor. And we could spend the whole day talking to Chris and not answer every question because who got like a little bit fuck when he started going form or two, one, whatever, and all this stuff. So basically, the answer is quite simple. Reach out to Chris, right? I've used loads of tax advisors over the last few years, and I've, I'm, I've started to work with Chris over the last number of months, and things are just, I wish I did it years ago, basically. So the answer is reach out afterwards, and you've realized just now that it will help you structure all of this correctly. You're never going to get every question answered today. You're not going to, and every, the, the, the danger in this room is when somebody asks a question like we had earlier, is if it's asked, and unclear, if you ask that question to your advice, you know you had a meeting in the room with your the mentees and they were told something, and then if you went and asked the question to your tax person the way you asked it to Chris, then it's very hard to answer a question that's asked wrong. You need to be very clear when you ask a question, otherwise you'll get the wrong answer, right? Yeah. And at the same time, what happens is, like when I started working with Chris, he'd ask me a question and I'd give him the wrong answer. And then he'd ask me another question, and then he'd go, that's not what you said earlier. And then I'd go, oh, yeah, but, and then he'd go, yeah, but you see, you gave me the wrong answer. And I'd go, okay. Because actually, if you have a one-to-one, -one and you spend 30 minutes or whatever length of time it is going through stuff, the way you ask the question wrong, the first question, by the fifth question, he'll realize you asked the wrong question, and then he'll tell you you asked the wrong question and fixed the wrong question. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. In a non-making sense way. Did that make sense? Yeah, can I, can yeah. I give you... Yeah. That um, I'll give you a number. Um, can I just give you a, a simple scenario about C bill loans? You remember C bill loans when they got the fifty thousand pounds? Bounce back loans. Bounce back loans. Yeah. Um, and um, <laughs> what happened is that um, Irish English. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened is that um, I was talking to a client. That's our phone number, 020-8878-3949, Wilkins Southworth. If you, uh, sorry, that's not even very good. So the bounce back loan. So I said to the client, I was talking to the client, and I said, how's things? He said, fantastic, I've just bought a new car. I said, oh, that's good. How did you get the new car? I said, um, oh, I got a loan. So um, I paid it out of that. Where'd you get the loan from? Oh, that, that C bill something, something, I got 50 grand. I said, no, you didn't, your limited company got that. Yeah, well, so what? It's my company, I own it, right, so I've got the money. I said, yeah, no, but you, you can't take the money out of the company because mm -hmm. it's the company's money. All right, okay, um, uh, call it a dividend, but you haven't made any profits. The company hasn't made profits. If you don't make profits, you can't have a dividend. So a dividends are paid out of distributor reserves, so you need a profit, then you pay corporation tax, what's left is the maximum dividend. Okay, okay, um, 50 grand, call it a salary, but you haven't got a PAYE scheme. Okay, all right. Well, all right, I've borrowed it. Well, now you've got Section 455 tax. That's because people don't realise the difference between a limited company and them. And you've got to bear in mind, I'm the director, I'm the shareholder, but it's still a separate legal entity. And until you actually understand the difference between that 
LLP, sole traders, whatever, then that's the fundamentals for the rest of it. Round of applause. <laughs> Come on. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, yeah, let's go. We, we need a picture. Right, and we all need to do sorry, this I'm at the background to, and whatever. Sorry, I'm, I'm supposed to do one of these. How do I? You've got it. Yeah. No, that's the wall. Yeah. Spin it this way. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, is that better? That's better. Down a bit, down a bit, down a bit, down a bit. No, 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 no. Sorry about this. Can you get yourself in? Oh. There. Sorry. I've done it packed in photos. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, couple of things. Lunch till what time, Asha? 25 past two. 25 past two. Two things before you go, though. At 25 past two, we're back. 20 past two, really. 25 past two, something like that. Uh, we're going to run to some... There's loads of prize draws. You've all got a ticket. We're going to do some prizes and stuff to, like, later on today and tomorrow. First prize is you've got to be back in the room on time after lunch, and we're going to do a prize directly after lunch. But outside of that, we're going to do a social media competition, because I've just decided. So... <laughs> You've got to go all over social media, post about this weekend, post about Chris, post about Kira, talk about how the event was, etc. Post about yourselves, whatever it may be, and then we as a group will vote a winner or something at some point tomorrow. Would that be cool? Yeah. Yeah. And um, say hi to Joe at the back. Joe's here all weekend doing camera. If anybody, if anybody wants some exposure and to help me as well, if you want to give a testimonial to uh, at any point over the weekend about what you're doing, talk about what you're doing, etc., they can use that on the Progressive Property social medias, Instagrams, etc. Bit of promotion for you, bit of promotion for me. If you do do one, make sure you mention Kevin McDonald, not a burger, and call it No Money Down Mastermind, not NMD. It sounds like a disease. <laughs> Outside of that, let's go to lunch till 2 what? 2.20 and Chris at the back for any of the other questions. <laughs>